speakers uh, join us. Uh, we're going to have an on-the-record conversation about the feature of USTDA, the U.S. Trade and Development Agency. Um, you know, part of my job at CSIS, I'm Dan Rundy, I hold the Schreier Chair here, um, is to stop um, er erroneous things from happening. Uh, the, I think uh, there has been a proposal to zero out uh, USTDA uh, in the so-called skinny budget. The U.S. Congress has responded and increased it it's spending by 25%, whatever the past year. So you have uh, Congress saying this is a really good thing, and we have uh, administration that's uh, indicated they're not quite sure about it. So um, it's, uh, you know, we've done a number of things with uh, USTDA over the years, and um, from my experience, when I think about what they do, they do three basic things. They do feasibility studies, they cost share using American um, consultants to work on feasibility studies for infrastructure projects and power projects in the developing world. Um, they also have a business line, a very interesting business line. We did an event last year on this on um, looking at the um, strengthening the capacity of developing country procurement officers. Um, I don't know how many of you are friends with people in windowless offices in developing countries who have to be procurement officers, but um, they oftentimes need a lot of uh, capacity building, and there's been a shift in the last several years moving away from the concept of low bid to a concept called life cycle cost. And you've seen this in the World Bank's de facto standards on, um, de facto standards on procurement. It's, it's in essence the de facto playbook that developing countries use as the World Bank's playbook on procurement, and uh, they've included life cycle cost. And so you're going to see, and so the ability to actually train people up to a life cycle cost standard is in the American interest because um, if we use life cycle cost as a way to buy goods and services, then oftentimes the United States, people will buy goods and services provided by the United States. So that's also in the American interest. The third line of business, very interesting, is something called reverse trade missions. So that is potential buyers flying to the United States to look at American goods and services, whether it's Caterpillar or GE turbines, et cetera, to consider what they're going to purchase. So you, if I was thinking about, I was going to create an international agency that was custom built for the Trump administration, I would think about USDDA. All the money's kept here. It's about encouraging American jobs. It's about encouraging American exports. It's very focused on energy, very focused on manufacturing. Um, so uh, there's a reason why the US Congress likes it. So, um, and I've convened this group today of uh, very thoughtful people who will be able to provide some perspectives on this. Um, I wanna have a conversation about some of the critiques about USTDA. Mm -hmm. I wanna talk about some of the opportunities for USTDA and the, uh, the impact that USTDA is having. Um, do I think that USTDA is duplicative? No, I do not. Do I think that USTDA <coughs> is ineffective? No, I do not. Uh, do I think that USTDA is corporate welfare? No, I do not. Um, I do think those are the sorts of comments that people make when they critique USTDA, and I exp I'm hoping that uh, my colleagues will have a chance to react to some of the critiques, because I think they're important to at least to engage. Um, I think it's very important to have, um, to have this conversation. I think that uh, it's certainly legitimate that the Trump administration has, has put this, this conversation on the table. I do think we need to think about the context of China as a credible soft power competitor. We have to think about the business opportunities in Latin America, Central Asia, Southeast Asia, uh, Africa, uh, and elsewhere, whether it's in power or energy. If we care about infrastructure, we care about manufacturing, we want people to buy American and hire American, one of the vectors to do that is gonna be USTDA. And if I think about how we're going to transition out of having a traditional aid paradigm to a cooperation and trade paradigm, and I think about what would be an appropriate middle-income country agency, I would think about USTDA. So I think as time goes on and as, we, as our friends in the Trump administration understand the potential of USTDA, I think they will become converts to it and see it as a vehicle for American jobs and American exports and for American manufacturing. So with those comments, uh, I'm uh, going to start with my first speaker, my friend Lee Zak, who's the immediate past head of USTDA. You have the biographies <coughs> in front of you, the speakers. I'm not going to run through them. Uh, and I'm going to hand it over to Lee to make a couple of comments. Lee? Thank you. Thanks very much, Dan, for convening this group. And thank you, folks, for coming out in the rain today. And I know there are a lot of people online as well. 
Um, you did a phenomenal job of describing what USTDA of today is. And from what I have seen of USTDA, it clearly is an amazing, modern, independent federal agency. It is one that is extremely effective, and it's one that holds itself accountable. If you look at the results from USTDA, they're results that any private sector business would love to have. For every dollar that USTDA invests in programming, it's seeing $85 in return to the US economy. So I agree with Dan. This clearly is an agency that should be embraced. Not only is it an agency that shouldn't be eliminated, I would argue in this administration, USTDA should really be scaled up. Because what the administration has talked about is creating and supporting American jobs. And that's exactly what USTDA does. It is unique in its mission. It is the only US government agency that has a dual mission that focuses on economic development and building infrastructure abroad, but to do it with US exports. And it's good at what it does. It has an amazing staff. It's developed relationships around the world. And as you see from the 1 to 85, it is incredibly effective. What does that mean? What does 1 to 85 mean? It means for every dollar that it programs that, we, that USTDA has seen $85 in US exports. What that translates into is jobs in the United States. Okay, so I'm a very simplistic person. Yeah. So, so that means, so TDA, someone comes to TDA and says, I want to do, a, I want to build a uh, aluminum soda can factory in Nigeria. And I need to demonstrate that um, there's actually a market of beer and soda. There's enough beer and soda drank in Nigeria. So I need to hire somebody. And so in essence, TDA says, I will cost share. I will cost share with a company to help identify the right consultant to help identify what's the size of the market, right? And then you'll send someone out there. You'll create kind of the, the most fabulous feasibility study, you might also then say, we're going to fly in some Nigerian investors to come look at, say, uh, an American manufacturer who might be able to build such a plant in, right? Is that what you're mm -hmm. talking about? That dollar is involved. That's the dollar spend that you're yeah. talking about. Is that correct? Exactly. It's okay. a dollar putting it, put into the programming for that feasibility study or to bring delegations to the United States to meet with U.S. businesses. Okay. So I'm sorry, Lee, I have a couple sure. of questions for you. So if someone says to you that USTDA is corporate welfare, what's your response to that? I would say it's not corporate welfare. Um, it clearly is an agency that is leveling the playing field for US businesses. The market today is global. I had an opportunity to talk with a US business recently that is a medium-sized business that creates equipment, that manufactures equipment in the United States. What it indicated is when you are exporting, when you're selling abroad, it's really hard to get doors opened for you. That if you want to invest, Everyone wants to talk to you. But if you want to export, and what USTDA did for them is they were able to make those connections. <clears throat> they were able to open the doors. So this is a company from, you know, from Iowa that USTDA opened the doors so that they can make those connections. It's leveling the playing field because I can tell you <clears throat> that other governments are doing this around the world. And I know many like people- China? like China, like Germany, um, and you, the, many people on this panel have had significant experience with respect to seeing what other countries are doing. Okay, but Lee, I've got a couple more questions for you. So if someone said to you that USTDA is duplicative, what's your response to that? Absolutely not. It has a unique mission. Congress created it separately and indicated that it was the agency through the Jobs Through Exports Act, which had the mission to look at foreign uh, assistance but with, with bringing U.S. exports as part of that. With a focus on American jobs. American jobs it is. Okay. So if someone said to you it's ineffective, what's your response to that? Again, absolutely not. If you look at an agency, I'd, I'd you know, challenge most private sector companies to have a return of 1 to 85. Okay. Thank you very much. Nilmany, thanks for being here. When I think about the last five or six years in the, in the Obama administration, I think about the anything that came out of the Congress on foreign assistance or soft power of any significance, I associate those successes with you. I know you're now in the private sector at Tetra Tech,
but um, I thought you were a very effective public servant both on the Hill and also in the Bush administration. So um, you know, I know you've had some exposure and experience with USTDA. I would welcome your thoughts about USTDA. Thanks for being here. Oh, thanks, Dan. Um, where I work now at Tetra Tech, we're one of the companies that does the most fabulous feasibility studies that, that Dan mentioned earlier. My colleague John Sachs is in the room who actually has done the studies um, in, on every continent. And, um, and so we have a, 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 that perspective as, as well as from the Hill doing oversight of TDA. Um, I wanted to, to kind of build on what you said earlier about how <coughs> the administration proposed zeroing out TDA while Congress um, increase the FY17 budget by 25%. Um, and kind of look at a quote from um, Representative Yoho, who's a, a veterinarian, just like my dad was, from Florida. And he's a Republican who is a member of the Freedom Caucus. So he's not a communist. Correct. Right? So he's not a real left winger. He, he is um, not close to the left. <clears throat> no. And um, so as he's over here, he testified in front of the, the House Appropriations Subcommittee on State and Foreign Ops operations and on, Mar on March 16th and he said the State Department and US development agencies work around the country and the world to advance America's economic interests by promoting exports that today make up almost 13 percent of America's 18 trillion dollar economy and support one in five American jobs on the same day the the White House released its skinny budget calling to zero out TDA and, um, and here's why I think that, that they have the opportunity to, to reverse that decision. Um, if you look at, at what the president said at his inaugural address, he said every decision on trade, on taxes, on immigration, on foreign affairs will be made to benefit American workers and American families. Well, TDA benefits American families. TDA's programs, as, as Representative Yoho pointed out, supported an estimated 300,000 U.S. jobs and generated over $56 billion in U.S. exports since it's been, it was established in, in 1992. 300,000 jobs, it's just huge. And TDA's history is great, but really what's more interesting is what it can do in the future. And TDA, I think, is an agency of the future. Um, it needs to keep helping U.S. companies get a toehold outside our country. When 95% of the world's consumers are outside of our borders, we need to be there. We need to be selling to them. And um, without, if we don't do that, our companies, American companies, are not going to thrive. Um, and when, as you mentioned earlier, our, our companies are facing an unfair pl playing field. It's China. It's European um, governments. They're subsidizing their companies' global expansion. And I'm not at all arguing the U.S. should be subsidizing uh, U.S. companies' expansion. But we do need to use our tools in a smart way, whether it's TDA or the U.S. Trade Representative, um, whatever is in our arsenal to limit the market distortions that other countries are creating. And if we let their practices go unchecked, we're, our companies are losing out on current deals. If we aren't there, we're not going to be there in the future. China gets this. The American Chamber of Commerce in China wrote earlier this month that China's aggressive mercantilist policies are one of the most serious threats facing the future of U.S. advanced technology sectors. And they say the U.S. government isn't doing enough to counter the threat. So when we're not in the room, uh, our competitors are setting the rules. And um, that's hurting our U.S. workers now, but it's going to hurt generations of U.S. workers in the future. So, um, I, in sum, I, I think that we really need to, to focus on why TDA matters, not just for us, but for our children. Okay, so Lily, if I said to you uh, that USTDA is corporate welfare, what's your response to that? I would say that it, it's an important tool to support U.S. companies, just like we have other tools um, and other policies that support American businesses. If we can't be against economic growth, that is just un-American. If I said to you it's duplicative, what's your response to that? Um, it, it's actually unique. I mean, if you actually, I mean, I think it's easy to look at the title and say trade and development. There's people who have trade in their title and other people have development in their title. Like, mm. So I think if you just look at titling, I think there's some duplication of words. But if you look at what they actually do, it's different than what other agencies do. If, you, if I said to you it's ineffective, what's your response to that? Oh, it's clearly effective. I That's mean, what it I just, say like, too. just like, I mean, it, there's evaluations and then there's just the numbers. Thank you. Thanks, Nilmini.
Okay, George, thanks for being here. Why is GE on this panel? Why does GE care about this? Well, a, a couple of things, Dan. Um, you know, GE is, a, uh, we're 125 years old, so we've been around a while. We're a pretty well established company. Uh, in the last 25 years, we've gone from a complete fit flip. In, in 1982, 80% uh, of our revenues was generated in the United States. And in 2017, we anticipate that 70% of our revenues are going to come from overseas markets. That's the most amazing statistic. Yeah. Could you just repeat that? Because for our television audience out there. For our <laughs> television audience, we went from 80% uh, selling in the U.S. In 1992. In 1982. In 1982. To 70% selling in, uh, in overseas markets. Okay, so this is not your grandfather's multinational. It's not, and it's not Thomas Edison's GE either. Amazing. It's a, it's a different company. And, and I, I'm, I come from the power sector, uh, and I'd say that this dynamic is particularly <coughs> pronounced in, in the power sector. There are about 1.3 billion people around the world who lack access to electricity. And so it, it's not in the United States where that's happening. It's mostly in the emerging markets and places where TDA, frankly, it, it's, in, it's in TDA's wheelhouse. So, uh, and I'd say, you know, when I look at this from a competitive landscape, I'm not really looking so much at China as I am looking at, at Europe. You know, our principal competitors are, are Siemens out of Germany or Mitsubishi out of Japan. Um, and these are companies which are national champions uh, in, in their host countries. And so I'll give you a great example. In 2015, Angela Merkel traveled to Egypt and brought the CEO of our German competitor with her. And they signed a $9, mil, $9 billion deal uh, to provide electric uh, generation equipment to Egypt. It wasn't even a, it wasn't a, a tender deal, it was a negotiated deal, and the German government provided financing. So this is the kind of environment that, that we're operating in. It's not enough to have superior technology, which we believe we do. You have to be able to bring financing, and you have to be able to bring some form of differ differentiation that shows a government interest in emerging markets. And, and I think t for us, TDA is, is that kind of a differentiator. It does help us differentiate our technology. The, you know, we've hosted a couple of these reverse trade missions at our, uh, at our gas turbine facility in Greenville, South Carolina. That gives us the ability to talk about our efficiency advantage and to walk potential customers through the, the amount of money that they will save over the lifetime of a project by investing a little bit more in more efficient technology. And so TDA's focus uh, on, on life cycle evaluation and, and procurement is, is absolutely essential. So that, that's kind of what we get out of it. And I'm going to anticipate a question from you, Dan, that, that, that says, is, is TDA corporate welfare? And you know, you've got a big company like GE up here, and I think that you know, we get subject to that kind of criticism frequently. And, and I'd say this, when we sell an advanced gas turbine, um, that's 3,000 people in Greenville, South Carolina. Working that, for GE. Working for GE alone, that are, that are, are, whose jobs are sustained by, by us selling that turbine. 1,100 of them actually put their hands on, on that turbine. And that's not counting uh, a bunch of other people outside of Greenville that work on sales, that work on engineering, that work on commercial contracts, that work on providing technical support. So there's, a, there's you know, dozens, if not hundreds, of more jobs across GE that are affected by that. But that's only where the, the employment impacts begin. Um, so when we sell a gas turbine, uh, our most advanced model, the, the, the 7HA out of, out of Greenville, we have 148 suppliers uh, around the country. Uh, most of them are small and, and medium-sized businesses. So if you average, say, that there's 50 people uh, per supplier, and that's probably a conservative estimate, but but if you do, you're looking at something like 7,500 more additional people around the United States whose jobs are directly dependent upon GE being able to sell its turbines overseas. Well, th these turbines weigh 600,000 pounds. We have to get them out of the factory and get them to the market. So that means they're shipped by rail to the port of Charleston from Greenville, South Carolina. And that puts the rail companies uh, in business as well. And then the port of Charleston in, in, in South Carolina um, sustains one out of every 11 jobs in the, in the state of South Carolina. So you begin to see the kind of cascading effect uh, that these kinds of uh, sales have on our economy, not just for the big GE, but across the board around the country and with small and, and medium-sized businesses. So, so, so George, is it fair to say that TDA has been a pump primer for your ability to sell uh, the uh, power generation equipment that GE and its m 
over 100 suppliers in the United States and the thousands of jobs that are linked to it. Is that, is it, is that a I fair think, way to describe it? I think it? you just put it beautifully, Dan. Um, let me give you a great example. Um, so uh, we recently, we, in the last three years, we've concluded two deals in, in the country of Algeria. Uh, one initially to sell them a, a large volume of gas turbines and a second to provide upgrades to their installed base of, of, of gas-fired power, power plants in the country. If can, you can tell me, how much money was that when they Well, I'll get there because it's, it's kind of the punchline. Okay. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> so TDA was involved uh, by offering a training grant to our customer contingent upon the selection of GE uh, in, in, this, uh, in this competition. And, and that was, a, you know, we have, to, we have to do our jobs. We have to be efficient. We have to be cost-effective with our technology. But this is a real differentiator in that competitive environment that, that I described earlier. So TDA's involvement had a direct impact on, uh, on generating about $3.5 billion worth of U.S. exports to Algeria, uh, coming largely out of our factory in Greenville, South Carolina, and some other locations we have around the world. So okay. I'd, I'd say, Mike, uh, I'd, I'd wrap it up, Dan, by saying in this kind of environment, I, I agree completely with Lee. Um, we shouldn't just be preserving TDA. Uh, we should be expand. We should be strengthening and expanding it. Okay. So, George, is there some other government agency that does what TDA does? No, there's not. I, I think the, the so challenge. So, someone says it's duplicative. I, what I, would your response be to that? I'd say absolutely not. I think the the, the challenge for TDA really is that it kind of gets lumped into this broader concept of export promotion, um, which you know kind of is you get other agencies like OPIC and, and XM and TDA all being tarred with the same brush. But, but TDA's role is very niche oriented, uh, you know, with these reverse trade missions, with the feasibility studies, uh, and with the training grants. So there's training. nothing else out there that's doing this sort of thing. Okay. So Rudy, I brought a, a can of soda for you on your honor, so I'm gonna ask <laughs> you to pass this down to my new friend, Rudy. So Rudy, you are from, you flew in from Missouri. Um, I'm not gonna say you brought the, the nice weather with us, because I know you, you were dealing with floods in Missouri. But you made it, uh, you felt very strongly that you wanted to be here, and I really appreciate you coming. Um, you're not a General Electric, but you're an employer of uh, hundreds of people. Uh, it's your family, I think it's a business that's your family business, written. Yeah, it's a business that I started back in 1990. So tell us about, tell us, Rudy, the business that you're in, and tell us about how did you, tell, who are you, tell us a little bit about who you are and then tell us where you live, and then tell us about the business you started in 1990 and how you came across USTDA. Well, thank you. Uh, I'm an immigrant. I came to the United States in 1956 uh, after war-torn uh, Europe, and my family were displaced from Yugoslavia as Germans, and uh, I had lived in some of the types of camps that you see today where there's little children living in little camps. I got bounced around from camp to camp until I was able to uh, immigrate to the United States. And I guess one of the key moments that I remember is receiving a little care package with an American flag on it that had some orange cheese in it and some crackers and a few oranges. And so I've truly lived the American dream. I'm an immigrant that has come here with parents that had two suitcases and a couple wooden crates and have been able to build a business uh, basically around this package. Uh, back in the 1980s, uh, I started developing modular concepts so you could build entire processes with American labor and American goods and put those processes inside a container and ship them all over the world. Uh, in 1985, I built a facility in Guangzhou, China. Uh, in 1982, I built a facility in Taipo. I've built facilities in Venezuela and now in over 50 countries. Uh, one of the enigmas for me was how to get into the emerging markets of Africa. And so <coughs> we were introduced uh, to USTDA uh, kind of circuitously through someone else that wanted to go to Algeria, but uh, at the time that didn't work out. And eventually there's an opportunity that came up for Nigeria through some German affiliates. And I said, Real, you know, I really don't know and have any idea how to get through the potential corruption, uh, the security issues, and all the dealings that you have to go through for a little company like ours to go into Nigeria. So we approached uh, Tom Hardy and and TDA and asked them if they would help us with a feasibility study. So we spent about three years really studying the market, looking at distribution, looking at all the issues on what would make a successful plant. Uh, this package uh, looks pretty simple. 
The upper end of this package has a tolerance of plus or minus two ten thousandths. That's point zero 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 two, and it's made at three thousand a minute. Uh, it takes a process of uh, around thirty five million in capital equipment, another fifteen to twenty million in support equipment, and then a building. So it's a significant investment. Uh, the primary and there's a significant uh, amount of engineering that goes into this. Significant engineering, a lot of technology, and uh, it takes a company, you know, that sees they have a market of about 500 million cans. And in Nigeria, there happen to be over 500 million cans being imported from Europe and from South Africa. And so we felt there really was a market, uh, but until we concluded that study, and I think what people need to realize is that for small American countries, companies to go into these countries and understand the labyrinth of how you become successful is extremely difficult. Uh, I've been dealing with China for almost 30 years. I had to open an operation in Shanghai to continue to compete there because it's not a level playing field. And to understand who you're competing with, oftentimes you don't understand if you're competing with private companies or government funded companies. So to think that our country can't come to the table and participate in that process is kind of naive because we will be at an extreme competitive disadvantage. Like GE, a majority of my business is international. About 85% of our $225 million annual revenue is uh, international. We received the Missouri Exporter of the Year Award, the Illinois Exporter of the Year Award, and all of that is because of this little can and building modular systems. So the, the crux of it is that we finally uh, reached an agreement with an Israeli company to build the first facility in 2008. That was a $30 million project. In, 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 in Nigeria? Yeah, in Lagos, Nigeria. We completed two more facilities in Lagos. We've been to Nairobi, Kenya. We've been to Angola. We've been to South Africa. We've been to Morocco. We've been to Egypt. We're now taking on another pro several projects in Africa. But the net is that we, we Raceline, has benefited from that first initial investment of $225,000, which we returned in a check to Lee, uh, of almost $225 million. We've kept over 500 people busy, and like GE, it's not just our employees. This is in the United States. The, oh, These yeah, are 500 is, employees in the United US. States. But, but think of the thousands of people now that are employed in these places that have hope. So it's not just Americans. If we in America think we're going to solve the problem of ISIS and Al Qaeda and all these things that are erupting around the world with just military might, we're not. They need hope. Those people need hope. They need jobs. They need opportunity. They need energy. They need a light bulb in their house. And if we disengage from that process, we're not going to win just militarily. We can't put all our eggs in the military basket. We have to win the hearts. When I send my people out, what their key mission isn't just to install a can manufacturing facility, it's to win the hearts and minds of the people that they work with locally. Because those people want the same things we do. And when we give them new technology that employs them and it gives them hope, it gives us an opportunity to show them what Americans, the average citizen, is all about. And not just a guy with the military hat and the M16. So I think it's critical uh, that this agency, and why I'm here today, is that I, I think this agency played a key role in our opportunity in Africa. That credibility gave us many other opportunities. And I have to speak to one, we're doing a project with Smithfield Food right now in northern Missouri. They have two million hogs. We're taking the manure from those two million hogs with a technology that I've developed that purifies that in an anaerobic digestion and makes natural gas out of it. I'm selling that gas to Duke Energy. I'm selling that gas to the California market. But the reason I got that job is I knew nothing about that process. The reason I got the job is because the president and general manager of Missouri <clears throat> spent a year and a half in Nigeria building a project that completely failed. And because he admired the fact that I was able to complete a project in Nigeria, he gave us the opportunity. It's turned into a $100 million opportunity in northern Missouri. And, and, and so I think there's these, I, I don't know how to define the word, but there are these side effects that happen as a result of an opportunity like that. And I have to look at all the side effects, and there's many of them that I can't even describe today. But I think they play an essential role in helping levelize the field for small companies and large companies, because we represent both. Uh, and they're, they're a key to staying at the table in this international business. Our business in the U.S. in this product has declined by 10% in the last 20 years. So people are drinking, using less, less of those cans in the U.S.? 
Yeah, we're making less and less because it's going to plastic, but more and more people are changing away from sugar, high sugar content drinks. And you know, this, this is still the most recyclable product in terms of a package. And when you look at life cycle analysis, almost 60% of the cost of energy goes into making aluminum. And so when you don't have to refine aluminum and you can reuse this can, it's a significant energy saving. You can keep this product in this can for years probably. Uh, maybe not a beer. They put barn on dates on some of them, but that's, that's just the marketing. Really, point. there's all sorts of, li the liner is quite sophisticated. Yeah, there's a spray that goes inside the can. I mean, this is a 16 step process uh, that has significant amount of control system and conveying system. And we keep, you know, 200 people employed now. I think when Lee was there, we had 70. We now have 200 people employed in a 500,000 square foot facility. And that little town was, it was on its deathbed until we came in and resurrected it. And it's all manufacturing that's being exported throughout the world. And I think if more and more American companies looked at sending their entire processes through modular systems, we could expand our manufacturing industry significantly in this country. And not just think about manufacturing widgets, but actually manufacturing entire processes that we modularize, we pre-assemble, we put them in containers, and then we become responsible for the installation, construction, and startup of those processes. Thank you very much, Rui. Let me just, but let me just make sure I clarify and fully understand this. So you were looking at Nigeria. You had a lot of doubts. Uh, you needed to understand exactly what the opportunity was, and so you cost-shared with the U.S. Trade and Development Agency on a feasibility study that gave you the confidence and partners that you partnered with the confidence to collectively invest the money and time and effort to actually set up factories in Nigeria because of your partnership with USTA. Is that correct? Yes, and beyond that, I think they gave us a, a, a level of credibility going in with them that we were a credible company and that they introduced us to, to leaders within the because they'd have said, who's race line? But if yeah, they said, well, I've line? heard of the U.S. government, I've heard of them. And so having that association, I think, helped our company quite a bit. Great. Okay, Bill, you're here as the uh, chair of the U.S. Global Leadership Campaign Emeritus. You've worn many other hats here in Washington. Thanks for being here. Um, what, what prompted you to agree to be on this panel, in addition to me asking you? Oh, first of all, by way of introduction, let me just say this isn't my first rodeo. I uh, <laughs> represented Caterpillar for the last 40 years and retired last year from Caterpillar. So I'm not here on their behalf, but you always have yellow blood, so it's hard to get rid of it. <laughs> and secondly, there's a little bit of admission I have to give, um, and maybe, you know, I'm the one responsible. For much of my career, I championed issues like NAFTA, the free trade agreement with Chile, um, Australia, Peru, Canada, Colombia, Panama, um, also PNTR for China, all of those issues that were center stage in the election. So it's quite credible that if I never existed, we'd have a new president, another president right now. So it's all my fault. Uh, so uh, we just keep that in mind. Um, so let me start out with, since I'm responsible, talking about the things that I agree with. And when you think about trade and development, the first thing you got to keep in mind is the first prerequisite is you've got to be competitive. If you're competitive, all trade is an opportunity. If you're not competitive, all trade is a threat. So when you think in terms about some of the things that are on the agenda item, some of which are being uh, addressed right now, a lot of it is to make America more competitive. Better regulations. I think, there, at least within the business community, there's wide acceptance of that as needing reform, a better tax system, better infrastructure, a better, better education system. These are all things that if we do it, and we do it in a robust manner, we are going to be more competitive, and trade for everybody is going to be, quote, fairer. But you know what? Don't matter how competitive you are, there's some markets where if they don't let you in, you're not, going to, you're not going to make the sale. So there's a second phase that you have to focus on, and this is where I would say there's honest disagreements with the, uh, with the administration. Whether it was the Trans-Pacific Partnership, whether it's the existing free trade agreements or NAFTA, the goal has been to lower foreign trade barriers, to allow us to sell our goods overseas in a uh, more open environment. It's important. 
If you're not allowed in, you're not going to make the sale. And I, there, I, uh, I have to say, while I fully understand why the business community is so focused on the first agenda list, I have to say, if, you, if you're not participating in the debate, you're going to lose a lot of ground in the second, which is you've got to have access to these markets. So you know, we, we need, as, a, as the business community, as the advocates, to be much more aggressive on talking about what we believe in. And as a general rule, the business community believes in trade liberalization and not protectionism. Now, what comes with opening foreign markets and why I do think at some point you will see a pivot in the administration to focus on this uh, is what are the other uh, ingredients that allow a business to compete? And that's why we're here right now. Because the U.S. Trade and Development Agency, it's small, you know, fewer than 100 people, it doesn't have a big budget, but it really gets phenomenal results. It's well run. One thing you know in Washington, if something is well run, you get no news. If Lee would have had a couple of good scandals, <laughs> you know, okay. we would Lee you know, was there we, eight years, there was the no talk, scandals. It would be the talk of the town. But she ran a great operation. And when you run a great operation, you're, you're not going to be featured, not in any of the, the, the blogs or the news media. But it does get results. And it's, it's a lot of times the feasibility study or the reverse uh, buying mission and what have you, that really does help. But the thing that I think it gives to companies, big but particularly mid-sized and small, it gives them credibility. It gives them credibility that they've got the government on their side and that what they're saying goes a long way. There's, this is. This is not just a fly-by-night operation. This is a company that not only provides a valuable service and gets results, but it has the support of the U.S. government. That by itself is worth an awful lot. So the mere fact that we're talking about this in one way might be good news, because it gives us all the opportunity to uh, learn about a well-run agency that gets great results for the American taxpayer and for the American business community and, by extension, American workers. But there's another thing that I think we all have to be mindful of. Sometimes we think that doing business in, in Washington is, is calculus. It's really complex. It's really basic arithmetic. There's things you're for, and you advocate for those, for those things. There's things you don't care about, so you don't care about them. And there's, there's things you oppose. Right now, the business community is very engaged in some of the big things they care about. But a lot of things that they will need to care about down the, down the road, they're either lethargic about or they're um, suggesting that they're not a big deal. Or they're distracted. Yeah, distract is another word. I mean, that's, that's right. But I'm giving people the benefit of the doubt. You know, I, we all love our sports analogies. But one thing I've learned, whether it's in politics or whether it's in sports, you can win on defense, you can win on offense, but if you forfeit the game, you lose. And in too many endeavors right now, the business community not only isn't on defense, but it's forfeiting. It is not lobbying aggressively for things it truly cares about. So whether that's open markets in big things like the Trans-Pacific Partnership, or if it's smaller, things that are very important to the business community, like the U.S. Trade and Development Agencies and OPIC, and it being more supportive of the XM Import Bank. If you're not, if you're seeding the playing field, you are going to lose. And then we'll have countless meetings, maybe at CSIS, where we talk about, why can't we rebuild those agencies that used to work so well? And After really they're broken. That. We can be more competitive, and we can open foreign markets at the same time, and it's important for the p business community to do both. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so Bill, if I said to you, is USTA corporate welfare, what's your response to that? You know, it's a, it's a heck of a good value, and that's how I do it. I, you know, this corporate welfare thing, I want corporations to do really well. XM Bank, it's, you know, we can have theoretical discussions on all sorts of different things, but it's a great deal. We have a president who says he cares about great deals. This is the way to prove it. 
This is a great deal. USTDA is a great US, deal. The US XM Bank is a great deal. The uh, OPIC is a great deal. It helps American companies, it helps American workers, and it helps people around the world. I'm doing an event like this on OPIC tomorrow. You can all come back tomorrow for my OPIC event, but, but USTDA is a great deal. It's a phenomenal. I mean, it's not even it's why it's even debatable. We should be here, you know, everybody getting Talking about how we juice the it results up. that it's getting. And on top, I mean, uh, the 56, how many people do you have working over there? It's, it's FTEs, they have 57 FTEs. F Federal 57 employees. employees. The and State Department has 25,000. Yes. Right? And it supports how many billion in exports? I mean, it, uh, last uh, $56.4 billion in exports during its existence. Okay, and how about last year? And last year was uh, over $3 billion in exports. And how about American jobs? And over 18,000 American jobs. Okay. <laughs> the last so time, if someone says it's ineffective. The last time the uh, taxpayers in the state of any state or, or federal government had a better deal was financing the Erie Canal, which made New York the financial and commercial capital of the United States. I'll tell you right now, this is a great deal. And if you don't know it, don't pretend that um, uh, you understand. Um, well, I'm not, I don't want to get, I don't wanna the, get too but colorful. Bill, this is but in the, this, say, I'm, but Bill, this is in the, from me, it's a but Bill, deal. this is in the one plus one equals two simple arithmetic category of yeah, great I deals, was, right? Yeah, I was an accountant for a long time. I actually know how to make it equal three. But in this case, <laughs> it's it equals four. That's it. Thank you. Okay. It. Can I can I jump in on one thing that was yes. mentioned in the corporate welfare and you know can U.S. businesses do some of these things on their own? Um, the reverse trade mission is a really good example where U.S. businesses can have a difficult time inviting delegations from abroad to come and see their goods and services. The host country may have concerns about their delegations being paid for by those companies or what kind of influence. So by USTDA inviting those delegations, bringing them to a variety of U.S. companies, they can make that trip. Um, and I also have to say, as was said before, other governments are doing exactly that. So let me stop you there. So Winston Churchill said the Americans will ultimately do the right thing after doing all the wrong things. I think that's the, um, it's something like that, right, Stuart? It's something in that zip code. So he'll do all, so I'm confident that the Trump administration is going to see the value for American jobs, buy American and hire American, and American jobs and helping keep us safer. And I, I, I take their, their view at their word. I agree with them, and I understand where they're coming from. And I believe that when they look at TDA, and I agree with Lilmany's analysis that because it has the word trade in it, and it has the word development in it, and because they don't really know what the heck it is yet, when they figure out what it is, they're going to say, oh, this is actually a pretty darn good thing. Um, so I'm confident that sooner or later that, that we're going um, we're gonna to pivot and say, gosh, this is a good thing. The U.S. Congress, in its wisdom, thankfully, understands its value and it's, is, has voted with its feet and has j jacked up its, uh, the amount of money it's going to get for just this fiscal, this fiscal year. So I want to pivot. I want to ask George and I want to ask Lee this question, which is okay. So let's operate as if, you know, I'm going to, let's suspend disbelief. And let's, just, let's, let's pivot the conversation in a different direction, which is, okay, let's assume that every, sooner or later there's going to be an accept, acceptance that China is a credible soft power competitor or we want to be, we want to be part of energy and infrastructure conversations all over the world and not just let China do this or national champions in Europe do this. And let's operate as if that if 95% of our customers in the world are outside of our borders, that and that we're going to need a, a very sophisticated export strategy. Could you both, George and Lee, talk about, let's look out over the next 10 years, what are some of the challenges and opportunities that we're going to need USTDA for, if I can put it that way? Can I just, you know, so Lee, when you walked out the door, if you looked out, you know, if you looked out over the horizon over the five years, what were some of the things that you were thinking about in terms of saying, boy, we're really going to need TDA to do A, B, and C? What are those things? Well, I think you really sort of, uh, you know, put your finger on it. I think China is the really big issue. Um, China is providing significant assistance to its, you could say, corporations um, to be able to get out around the world. That is significant competition for the United States. And the more that the United States doesn't have the tools and business doesn't have the tools to be able to compete, the greater market there's going to be. And by the time, if we delay, it's going to be too late. 
There are markets that are already taken by other countries, by the Chinese. And so it is extremely important that the U.S. companies have those tools to be able to create jobs abroad. So I'd rather have them drinking out of American soda cans, not Chinese soda cans, for example, right? Absolutely. Okay. And creating jobs in the U.S. is also the difference. Okay. Okay, yeah, George, so let me, start, well, let me just start with George and then I'll get to yeah, Reed. Just okay. two, yeah. two quick things. Yeah. I'd say, uh, for me, uh, U USTA really needs to continue its work on, on reform and procurement practices. Um, in the developing world? In the developing world. Okay, this is a super obscure but really important yeah, topic, it's right? it's extraordinarily important because... If you have trouble sleeping at night, I do. go read papers yeah, on this topic. And it gets me really excited as well. We had a video, so, if you have trouble sleeping at night, we did a program on this topic and if you have trouble, but it is darn, darn important. It, it is because... 35% of the GNP of developing countries passes through the hands of procurement officers in developing countries, right? right? And, and the vast majority of them are, are really focused on one thing and that's just their upfront capital expenditure. And so while they can get lesser efficient equipment more cheaply immediately over the 25 to 30 years that, that large infrastructure and particularly energy projects operate, the, the savings that are the, or, or the, the costs that they incur in terms of higher fuel costs, et cetera, um, are dwarfed. So you really need to look at this in terms of what is the life cycle cost uh, of that uh, technology that you're seeking to procure. And so this is going to be really a huge, smart. this is going to be an existential issue for United States companies going forward, is that correct? Uh, I, well, certainly for technology companies, uh, you know, higher technology So if you want like people to buy American, mm -hmm. the concept of buy American, that's a, that's a simpler word for procurement, right? That's so correct. you want people to buy, procure American, right. then things like life cycle costs and having people competent to actually carry out analyses on life cycle costs is going to yeah. be really important for American technology companies. Is that correct? It is. Okay. And I'd say that the, the second and somewhat related issue uh, is that we're really, and, and this is beyond power, but really more in the industrial space, mm -hmm. we're really moving into a new era where software is going to have a really big impact, sort of the digital component and the internet of things. And uh, I think that there's very little understanding of that in this country, let alone in the developing so, world. So you're going to ask some, some low-level uh, civil servant in Angola to figure out the Internet of Things when they're making a purchase well, decision, just to that understand what you're the, Just to understand the power that can be harnessed and the savings okay. that can be harnessed. So you're going to need people who can train and explain and educate these folks on the opportunity that this op offers that's us. Is that correct? That's absolutely right. So okay. I think kind of expanding the the focus of, of industries that the TDA has to include this digital component is going to be absolutely critical. Okay, thank you very much. Rudy? Yeah, I, I've been, as I said earlier, I've been uh, dealing with the Chinese market for almost 30 years. And we opened an operation in Shanghai not only to stay competitive in the Chinese market, but to also see what the potential competition coming from Chinese players were. As I said, this is a fairly sophisticated technology, so there were only a few European companies and American companies that provided the OEM equipment. Uh, there's a particular company now in China that has actually taken that OEM equipment, copied it. So they've stolen the stolen technology. Stolen technology, drawing. They're going into plants that I built systems for, one time for Bow Steel, a uh, government company. They're stealing our technology. They're developing that cost. They're below our Shanghai operational costs and now coming out and trying to sell that technology to the rest of the world. So that's the kind of uh, that's the kind of that's the kind of playing the field you're dealing the with. Playing field that we're dealing with, and you know just as well, the oh capital expenditure on first-time cost is only part of it. Once you lose that initial cost, you're also losing the opportunity for the maintenance and exactly. the upkeep. And the, the if you have a basis of a billion dollars worth of equipment, you might have 20 percent of that annually in terms of services. So they're looking at it and saying, okay, we don't care if we make money on the first project. We're going to sell it below our cost because then they're going to take the services agreements, they're going to take the spare parts agreements, and they're going to keep you out. And, and so that's the threat that I see okay. for Americans. So they're not, they're not playing there by the... There is no intellectual property protection. Yeah, these guys aren't playing by the Marquis of Queensberry rules, yeah, right? But, Bill. If I, if I could just add one thing, because you know sometimes we all get caught up with the, the rhetoric, and I, some of the things Rudy said I think is right on. Look, we want America to be as competitive as possible. Having a, uh, a well-run, um, uh, adequately funded USTDA is part of that. But we're not against imports. We're not against development outside the United States. Um, you know, w you know markets, As these countries get richer, they buy our stuff. Markets, some of our biggest markets right now are markets that used to be recipients of USAID. 
So whether it's Mexico or Chile or Colombia or Panama or South Africa or Indonesia, those countries grew because we helped them. And now they're our biggest markets, or some of our biggest markets. So this is not a something where you, you, know, you, you have to make your point by bashing others. I mean, there's certainly a lot of unfairness in the world, and that needs to be addressed. And the whole goal of a lot of the trade agreements was to address that unfairness. But in the same token, you can do it in a respectful way that gets results and allows all parties to grow. Right now, we need to be more competitive, and we need to be respected around the world. All right, so I'm going to give Nilmini, and then I'm going to leave the last words. So Nilmini. I wanted to add on to, to George's really good point about technology. Um, TDA has done six billion in, in projects, um, 733 projects in five continents. Um, and so it's starting there, but there's a whole huge amount more that they can be doing. And it, it does have the economic component to it that we've all been talking about, the importance for American jobs, but there's also a really important security component to it. Um, cybersecurity is, is just a, a, an, an as important part of national security as, as the other types of kinetic security. And when we look at other countries having their wares, their infrastructure, and their ability to monitor their wares and infrastructure, we are at a double advantage economically and in terms of, of the security of data. So um, it's really key that we make sure that we have um, American companies going in and doing technology around the world. Okay, Lee, you get the last word. Well, two things. Um, one, I do want to say that I strongly believe that USTDA continues to be well run with Eno Ebong, who is the current acting director of USTDA. And I absolutely agree with what Dan had said at the beginning, is if people hear about USTDA, what it really does, what its impact is, the stories we heard today, and they understand it, they will realize that this is an important tool for the U.S. government and one that creates jobs in the United States and that it should be scaled up. But people have to hear the story. So I thank you, Dan, for allowing people to tell their personal stories. And I thank all of you who are participating. And I hope you will continue to tell the story as well. Thanks. Great. Please join me in thanking the panel.